Okay, everybody. Hello, this is Dr. Ravi Kamali Reddy. I'm the CEO of Physician CEO and founder of Daytona Health. Um, welcome to webinar number five. And the title of our webinar today and what we're going to be talking about is uh, why your social circle determines your success. And joining me in this discussion today are going to be my colleagues, um, and I'll bring them up on stage. Hey everybody, I am Kevin Heine. I am Daytona's Director of Coaching and, and Customer Success. Uh, yeah, ha happy to be here. Happy to, to hear what all of our, our coaches have to say about this interesting topic. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Bill, welcome. Hi, I'm Bill Cole. I'm great, really excited to be here. I'm the uh, Performance Psychology Coach at Daytona. also do executive coaching and I'm on the advisory board here as well. Rachel, welcome to the stage. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a life coach here at Daytona Health, and I'm excited to be on the webinar today. Thanks, Rachel. And last but certainly not least, Laurel, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Laurel Tillman, I am a health coach here at Daytona Health. And again, with everybody else, I'm really happy and excited to be here today. Thanks, guys. I, I'm excited because this is one of these topics that everyone always talks about, but I think it's executing on keeping the right social circle means having difficult conversations sometimes and thinking about things in a way that's a little bit uncomfortable. And I wanted to get your opinions on how to do that. So to set up the discussion um, and real quick, before we go to that, I just want to say the thing about my disclosures. Um, I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest of any things we're going to be talking about today or any companies we may mention. Um, if anyone else on the team does have any disclosures, please feel free to present them. Um, let me see here. So let me bring up. So the company you keep. So let me go through just to set us up a little bit to understand why these social influences matter and why they matter almost in some sense, just as much as a cholesterol test or an EKG. Um, and we want to go through um, this idea of social determinants is the, the term that people are using about these ancillary things in our lives that have direct influences on our health, and longevity, and performance. And specifically, we want to talk about friends, the work circles, mentors, family, and also instead of focusing on everybody else, it's like, how do we become good friends for everybody and show up for others too? And I think that's an important part of it. So just to set us up on what this means in terms of social determinants, it's the idea that if you take somebody's collective influences, you could divide them up into categories that aren't just genetics. There's how much money you make and how stable your economic situation is your education level and your capabilities, your access to healthcare, where you live and the environment around you and your social circles and community. And you can see that these are very, very important. Does anybody looking at this circle right now thinking um, this probably covers most of it? Or are we missing some huge, are, are the public health officials of the world missing a huge chunk that we know about? In, okay, it looks like we're good. I think, yeah, I think we're probably all in agreement that it does. Yeah. It covers just about everything, you know. Um, it, you could break it down into smaller segments, but it does. It encompasses. It encompasses everything. And I think for the the, the coaches, it's like these are the kind of things we end up talking about in longer discussions, don't we? They kind of fall in these categories. The other thing yes. that I thought was interesting is how do you all think about this breakdown in terms of relative importance? So this is the Kaiser Family Foundation and doing a breakdown on kind of the impact, the relative impact of these different factors on risk of premature death. And where you can see now, I, I don't agree with this. I, I know there's some data behind this, but I think that we actually depend more on behaviors than it's being counted here. And I think those are a lot of overlap, but isn't it interesting, you know, genetics is at 30%, but the interesting thing is that healthcare per se is 10%. Whereas yeah. these other factors are so much higher, our individual behaviors and the influences from the environment and our social structures. What do you all think about this? Well, I, you know, I agree in thinking that, you know, healthcare needs to be a bigger percentage of that. Without health, that's everything that we're striving for. And without that, you know, the individual behaviors are changed and are modified based on health and your health care or availability or access to health care uh, or not having any health. Uh, same thing with your social and environmental factors. Um, it's all determined by the amount of, you know, your health and your health care and what you're able to receive or not receive. Yeah. So I think it does need to be a bigger percentage. Well, this, this idea of health and well-being really, the health care 
traditional healthcare system really has a lower part to play in a lot of mm. these things versus the other elements in terms of health and well-being. I think this is intuitively true. I think I would even say my my instinct is to increase that blue and that that orange a little more than genetics. <laughs> um, but I know there's probably overlap in this. Now, that being said, oh, sorry, Kevin, what were you saying? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's, it's I, I wonder if we, you know, pulled the population it, if they would put healthcare that that low, what they thought the the relative impact would be, I'm I'm guessing no, because I mean, just thinking about kind of the amount of dollars and cents we put into these things, it's like healthcare is number one on that list by far, probably, right? You know, like, uh, well, it definitely is, uh, but that that kind of relative impact for that to be so for healthcare to be only ten percent um, is striking to me. I don't disagree with it at all. It, it just, it, it, it is, uh, it, it jumps out to me. And then, yeah, I, I agree. I'm, again, I might be a little biased thinking that behavior is, is so, so important, but behavior might be even a little bigger. And, and yeah, I think we're finding more and more that these social and environmental factors are, are an even bigger part of, of what determines our health. Yeah. And I think when we were yeah. talking about healthcare, I was thinking of, um, you know, medicines, you know, different prescriptions mm. that people are taking and, I think a lot of people are finding there's so many side effects to prescriptions. So behavior um, and our environment are very important to, for our health. For sure. we, can, we can take more control of our health um, in, in the world and not be relying on these medicines and stuff like that. But in, in general, healthcare um, is letting us down a little bit to, for the availability for everybody um, as well. Not everybody can afford it. So um, there's that too. But yeah. It's I'm surprised it's ten percent in a sense. Yeah, it's and it's it's um the, that ten percent which encompasses, you know, a, a million doctors, nurses, physical therapists, you know, billing codes, the pharmaceutical companies, just not really set up to handle individual behavior change or the the social environmental factors. So it's like there's a lot of bang for buck in terms of resources that you could you're putting resources into the other areas, isn't there? So one yeah, thing I want to do be, before yeah. we would forward is is i put this slide in here because i just wanted to give everyone permission to think like this in terms of it's is it okay to be picky about our, our social circles because i can imagine that some people are just going to feel bad and this somehow feels a little bit machiavellian unfriendly and too strategic or cold i mean is this okay for us to be thinking like this about our friends about whether our friends are helping or hurting us or are useful quote unquote or not yeah, I think it is very important for us to be selective about, you know, where we're going to spend our time with our friends because um, we, it's a, a, time is a resource we don't get back and our mm -hmm. friendships, we need to have them of good quality for our own health. So I do think we need to be quite selective in who we spend our time with because there are people that will drain us or take from us and leave us depleted. And that is very toxic for our health. And um, so we have to be, I do think we do have to be quite choosy and be selective where we're going to spend our time and the quality of those friendships because they interpret really our health in the end. You know, we have to have connection. We have to have that community around us to be healthy and to be strong in our physical beings, you know, and our emotional well-being. So I don't think it's... Um, I don't think it's unfair. I don't think it's selfish to to think this way. Absolutely. I, I agree, Rachel. And I think that's right. Like that's kind of what separates friends from family, right? Like our friends, it's okay to be picky. We'll get into, I'm sure a little bit maybe about family and, and obviously <laughs> navigating some of that. We've talked about that in the past that there are also ways to navigate that successfully and, and not let that be a determinant of, of your behavior. But we get to pick our friends, you know? So, so I think we have a right to be, to be picky and make sure that we're surrounding ourselves with the right kind of people. So I've got two angles on this. Uh, when I do executive coaching, one of the first things I talk about is self leadership. Uh, you've got to lead yourself before you can lead others. So I think that is not being selfish in any way. That's being smart. And I discovered that uh, a lot of people have a career plan. When I work with athletes, they have a sport plan. How many people have a f family or friend plan? They don't really work on like some strategic idea of 
how am I going to arrange the people around me? They just sort of accept it as it is. I'm not blaming anybody, but they just sort of, well, there's my friends, there's my acquaintances, there's my close intimacies, and that's where they are. But they don't really think about how can I maybe maneuver some of that around strategically, not only to benefit myself, maybe to benefit them too, is that the flip side of self-leadership is now, can I be a role model for other people? And that's a very powerful motivator for a lot of folks. You, you get a dual approach now. You're being very potent. Yeah, I think I totally agree with that. I do think that, you know, what kind of friend you want to be, you, you have to look at yourself first and see what you're going to be offering other people as, you know, a friend to them. So it's good to look at, you know, the qualities in you that you want to share and spread with other people. And, you know, a lot of those you want to get back in return. Mm -hmm. So it is good to look at yourself first and see, you know, where you could be a good friend to other people too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, I think one of the things I wanted just to show the impact of kind of this friend circle, this idea of the social circle. Now, it's interesting. When we talk about friends, there's kind of friends and there's deep connections. And there's a real power to, to people who are not just in your deep connections, those 10 to 15 people you spend the most time with, but this idea of power of weak ties, people you're weakly tied to. Uh, I, I like this idea of Dunbar's numbers, a British uh, anthropologist who uh, Robin Dunbar talked about. The idea here is, and if you guys have heard about this number before, you know, um, we'd love to get your perspective. The idea here is that if you look at primates' brain sizes, you can do some do some math and predict what kind of social circles they can handle in terms of relationships. Like, how many people can they hold in a in in their social circle, um, uh, and, and kind of keep track of, so that you're in a kind of a tribe. And his idea is that humans, it's about 150. That no matter how you slice it, you could really only keep track of like the 150 people are in that circle. And you know, the the if there's 150 people in your neighborhood, it's like that movie The Burbs. You know, who were well, you know who's number you know house number A? What are they doing? You know, this couple over there, what are they doing? What are they like? What are they like? It's like that that social mingling is really important. And uh, it's interesting because since this number this number's obviously been disputed quite a bit, right? Uh, but what's what's uh, thrown a, a wrench into the into the, the work field a little bit is social media and online platforms and things. So now when you routinely can have 5,000 friends on Facebook or a million followers on Instagram, does that number change? And uh, the defenders of Dunbar's number will say, well, yeah, but you only really interact with about 150 or less of them. What do you guys think of this number? And it's an important one because I think you can't be friends with everybody. You have to be really choosy. We're talking about 10 to 15 really deep friends and probably no more than 150 to keep track of. Otherwise, maybe just diminishing returns in terms of time spent. Yeah, I think 150 even seems quite high. That's a lot to keep track of. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could keep track of 150 people. No, but you're right. <laughs> yeah, social media can make a big difference. You can mm -hmm. keep, you know, uh, that connection on social media, but it's brief and it's short and it's um, min minimal, you know, really um, 150 seems a lot. Um, yeah, I, I, I think having those 10 or 15 close people and, and spending quality time. And it's about quality, isn't it, when it comes to friendships? Because uh, if you're kind of looking after 150 people, it, it, more, it would probably feel more like acquaintances because you're only going to know yeah. a certain amount of things going on in their life and you're only getting snippets on Snapchat or Instagram. You're just seeing a lot of the, the good things in their life. You're not seeing the negatives. You're not seeing what's really going on in their lives. So it's... it's it's limited when it's up to 150 people for sure. That's right. So I want, I want to just go to the next one. Just so talk about the effects on health and longevity. Now there's so much data on this that I cherry picked just a few studies and just drive the point home that, you know, there was a long, there's a, there's a report from a very long study. It started, it's 85 years and going started in 1938 by the Harvard Study of Adult Development. So this is one of the longest clinical studies that, that exists, right? And in that study, um, you know, if you look at the, the, the regression, it's like the number one factor related to healthy aging was not a pharmaceutical. It wasn't a specific nutrition plan per se or something like that. It was good relationships. And I thought this was a very, very interesting result. And it's, it's very solid. It's been supported in other smaller studies as well. And even uh, I, I pulled this on, went up by Holt Lundstad, a meta review of 148, where this again was an, it, it, the, the thing that came out the most, is that people who age well 
are are have good relationships. There's this other idea. I know Kevin, you've talked about blue zones before too, and this is a finding, even though right. the blue zones are somewhat in dispute. You want can you talk a little bit about that and what did you guys think about? You know, are you surprised by this finding? Just to to speak to the power of um of of relationships. Yeah, just to speak quickly to that that idea of the blue zones again, not that the that the blue zones, everything that's claimed in that that book and, and by Dan Buettner, the author, is, is correct. But I think it's interesting. The, the idea I think I shared in a previous webinar was that of these different power principles in the in the blue zones, these common traits amongst these areas where people tend to live the longest. Uh, you know, a third of them basically had to do with a sense of community surrounding themselves with the right people and, and social dynamics. So uh, I just think that that's that's telling, even if the blue zones is not, uh, uh, you know, gold standard necessarily or anything like that. But telling that it wasn't it, it wasn't all related to how much you're moving or how you're eating or these other behavior practices. That was a part of it. But a big chunk of it, too, was those social determinants and, and social uh, connections. Yeah, I think that's the amount really of time thing. you're spending as well with people too. I think in those blue zones, they do have these rituals of, you know, seeing each other, you know, mm -hmm. in the social circles like church or, you know, in the street, in their, in their community, they're kind of spending quality time together, I think more frequently mm -hmm. than we do in the West coast on the West. Western yeah. hemisphere. Yeah. Western, Western culture. <laughs> yeah. <There you> <laughs> uh, also probably also on the West coast. Yeah, it's on the West Coast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> except oh, except Loma Linda, California, one one of yeah, the, uh, right. the blue zones. Blue zones. Oh, that's right. I didn't realize that. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. I forgot about that. That's very interesting. I didn't. I didn't know that. So no. again, I, I picked just a so so again just to drive home these positive and negative influences. Again, positive influences of friendships with returns with respect to health behaviors are pretty pretty widely studied. And I picked one of these here um, in terms of. You know, friends and peers, and even weak ties that have you know increase who are doing or engaged in healthier behavior, sleep, nutrition, exercise, so on and so forth, can also influence you as in in varying ways. One thing I, I picked this particular study on youth physical activity and motivation to be physically active, which was showed that increasing motivation, um, you if, by just having be around being around other peers, you know, people uh, 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 youths were just more motivated to eat better and perform more physical activity. Now, the reason I bring this up is because there's been a lot of controversy around um, the kind of pediatric obesity guidelines which were released a few weeks ago. You know, this idea of kind of getting that this is a growing problem with children and that the, the focus has been put on kind of pharmaceutical and surgical interventions even in an earlier age. And when I see that, and I think a lot of people block at that and say, hold on, there's, we gotta really rethink this. This doesn't seem to make sense given how obesity works and also how lifestyle plays such a, and, and role modeling plays such a huge role. And I think pouring money and investing in things like this, we're just like helping kids develop better friendships where they're peers, where they're supporting each other is just as valuable of an intervention if it means that people who are like, you know, kids who are obese can, can benefit from it. So I think that was one interesting play here on kind of positive influences of, of friendship. And it's funny that it's, not just the five people in that study, this wasn't necessarily study, but when you look at um, networks of people and how these influences work, what's very fascinating about this is, and this is by uh, Nick Christakis's work, he's an MD PhD out of Yale and he's an excellent researcher, you know, talking about it's not just the five people around you, it's actually more, it's the larger network of people. And one of the things that was fascinating was, you know, happy friends lead to more happiness, right? And that that is a repeatable finding. So the social circle that's happier just tends to be happier as a cluster and they cluster together. And the friend of a friend of a friend who is happier increases you know, by 6% your likelihood to be happy. Now, that doesn't seem like much like 6% happy. But, you know, there've been previous, there've been other studies that show how much money makes you happier. And like 6% is higher than 2%. And 2% is what's been shown before is the kind of happiness increase you get from like $10,000. So if you just arrange your circle of friends in such a way that you were clustering around happiness, that could significantly improve your well-being and happiness overall long-term more than like a financial benefit, right? Which I thought was, was fascinating. Um, the other thing, though, is that there are also negative influences of this, and this is what Christakis and Fowler, who's um, another, uh, he's one of his co-researchers, it's a classic paper from 2007, 
uh, UCSD talked about obesity and how kind of obesity and smoking can spread through networks too, in the same way, in a, in a negative way. And that, you know, friends who are obese increase your likelihood of weight gain by 45%, but friends of friends. So people you may not even have met just by having that second tier a connection who is overweight or obese means that you can predict that you will have an increased likelihood by 20%. So obesity, again, clusters in, the, in, in young adults and social networks. And the, the thought around why these findings seem to, to happen is this idea of norms. So I wanted you guys to talk about kind of this norms, like when you're creating friends in clusters and social networks, wow. there's norms that emerge out of that network. And that those norms can very much affect your mindset and uh, your motivation on what kind of healthy behaviors to engage in. What do you all think about that concept? I mean, it just it just makes makes a ton of sense logically, right? You, you know, you when talking about norms, like the behaviors you yeah. see as normal as acceptable are the behaviors that you see the most and that you're around the most. And, and if you're around people that engage in certain behaviors, in this case, things that lead to obesity or smoking, this is another example that you gave, you're going to see that as normal, acceptable, regular behavior. And you're more likely to engage in those, in those behaviors. Um, you know, we, I think it's human nature that sometimes we don't want to be the outlier, right? We don't want to be the one going in the opposite direction. We want to be a part of it, whatever it is, you know, a part of the group. And in this case, it's the people we surround ourselves. We want to be just, we want to be a part of our friend group. And if they're all eating McDonald's for lunch every day, then we're way more likely to eat McDonald's for lunch every day. And that's so true. I think, you know, the peer pressure, like when you were younger, like if you hung around with anyone that were smokers, you didn't want yeah. to stand out and not, you know, smoke. It was, you know, it, it, it's a lot of pressure to try and be different. And when you're really just wanting to be included and be part of a team or part of a, a group of friends, um, sometimes it can be that. And also, you know, I think, you know, certain people might have social anxiety or whatever, and they're not going out as much and they're, being more complacent and saying, let's sit in and get takeout. And it starts developing this habit of you just not going out socializing and you're getting takeout and you're sitting in and you're being more uh, complacent and relaxed and not moving your body as much. It'd be very easy to fall into that pattern of behavior with those friends that are not dealing with their social anxiety or dealing with any other issues that's going on with them. And you're just wanting to support them and be with them and you're just hanging around and doing the things that they like to do. Um, it would be very easy for you to fall into that pattern of behavior too. I could see that. Well then Rachel, I let me ask that. you something then. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, go, go ahead if you have a question, go right ahead. Uh, no, Laurel, please, please. Okay, I was just and going to, you know, I was thinking along those lines that even, you know, it's a human behavior to want human connection and want those connections, even when it's negative or going to have a negative influence or a negative impact on their lives. You know, we have a need for a human connection and it doesn't always have to be positive. You know, people seek out negative ones too, if that's what's available. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask all of you, but Rachel, let me pick on you here a little bit. I, so... Mm -hmm. Let's re-engineer the friend circle a little bit. Now, let's say you're coaching somebody and you're asking about this. How would you even start the process of helping somebody modify who their friends are, becoming aware and having some insight around it? What are you telling them to look for? You know, is this, a, is this what kind of exercises can you, can you help that person do to at least even be aware of this in terms of influences? Because most people, like, like Bill was saying, and you were saying earlier, we don't have a plan for this. Right. So how does that how do you guys start this plan? Yeah, I think, you know, it's really getting to know your own likes and dislikes. You know, sometimes we just don't really uh, identify what is where we want to spend our time. We just kind of go with the flow. We go along to get along and we're not actually like really putting investing our time into what we truly want out of the friendships or out of our relationships. And getting to know ourselves better, you know, understanding what needs we want to fulfill in these relationships, like how are these friends going to meet these needs in us and, um, and what boundaries we're willing to set with them, you know, 
to know what we're willing to put up with or tolerate in our friendships before going into them. I think just really getting to know ourselves a lot better before researching and, and you know, getting out there in the world and finding these friends that are going to match what we want in our lives at that current time. Because our wants and needs change over time. You know, when we're different ages, we've got different things that are more important to us. If we start a family and we have young children, we might be searching out those other new young moms or new families as well. So our kids have somebody to pile with and we have somebody to keep us company. So there's different stages in our life where we're going to be looking for different types of friends. And I think just knowing what our likes and dislikes are, how we want to spend our own time, you know, and will these new friends be interested in the same things that I'm going to be interested in. But we have to know ourselves a lot better uh, before we get out there. Instead of being this people pleaser and just falling into whatever other people want from us, because then we become resentful and we avoid people then because we're not asking for our needs to be met. We're not asking for anything. We're just pleasing others in that sense. So we need to identify what it is that makes us happy, what, how we want to spend our time and what activities we want to do and what, what social circles we want to be in and try to match those with those friends. So you literally, I mean, you're, you're applying a filtering algorithm in a very structured way. I mean, you're literally yes. saying, hey, I got to write these down and say, and then, yeah. and then, you know, is this fair? I mean, I'm, I'm making this very transactional on purpose because um, I want to just give people like literally, like really like what the, what are the steps? I mean, do you, have you, have you all, and this is a question for everybody, um, have you all just ever had, you know, show me your phone and the people on your favorites list? And like, have you, is, you know, is this a useful exercise? Just to, who are you calling and talking to? Who are those 15 people that are in that 150 cluster? Do you ever just help them go through that and just say, why are you spending, you know, who do you spend time with the most? Are they helping you, hurting you? Um, you know, things like that. Is that a useful type of exercise? Yes, it's really um, looking at your friend groups now and saying, you know, when you're with these friends, how do you feel when you're with these friends? Like, do you feel heard? Do you feel that they're empathetic with you? Are they good listeners? You know, when you're having a tough time, do they text you the next day and say, how are you feeling today? Are you any better? Like, are they following up to see, you know, have they got an interest in your life? You know, are they genuinely there for you, supporting you? Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's questioning those kind of friends. Are they there? You know, what, you know, what level of a friendship have you got with these people? And um, are they draining your energy or are they energizing you? Do they help you stretch yourself, get out of your comfort zone? Do they um, enjoy your company? Do you feel that you're not a burden around them, that you feel that you're belonging and you're, you know, connected with them in some way? So it's definitely um, looking into your friend groups and seeing the quality of the friend groups and look at your part, especially because you can't change others, but you can change yourself as well. And you can see, you know, how am I showing up in these friend groups? Am I showing up as a people pleaser, you know, or am I domineering and, and you know, railroading over my friends and insisting it being my way or the highway? You know, you have to look at your own behavior first and see. I'm going to put, kind of I want to put a pin up. in that because I, I want to come back to that for sure because I have that other yeah. last thing. So I want you to definitely speak about that as well. But I mean, how, what, what are the kind of traits, again, question for everybody, but maybe the health coaches can start here too, is what kind of traits are you looking for as we're starting to coach these people through mindset change, performance, but also specifically these, you know, better sleep, better exercise and better, um, you know, patterns of eating, a uh, real sustained lifestyle change. How have you all um, approached this topic with our members? Because especially, especially when you notice, for example, that these patterns, like you know, one of our members may just always be going to fast food on Thursdays, and when she's hanging out with you know A, B, or C, how do you approach that topic? Do you actually say maybe we should really rethink that friendship, or or you know, every time you hang out with this person, uh, two times, two, uh, every Friday, you really binge drink a lot. You know, it's like you're really consuming a lot of alcohol. Alcohol doesn't seem very safe or healthy. How do you approach topics like that with members or coaching clients? I, I could give you a little insight on how I work with salespeople, which is pretty similar. So they have a network of people they want to sell to. And uh, I ask them, uh, who are your center of influence people? Those are the people that uh, have the most leverage, the most money. They can do the most for you. 
they're the most important people. COIs, they're called. What's the ne next level down? Pretty important as well. And what's the next level down? So we have like ABC. Now that can be applied to what we're talking about here, where who in your world helps you the most, gets you on the right track, keeps you on the right track, supports you. Uh, if you're going to go to McDonald's, they say, no, let's go get a salad. That, that's your COI group. And you literally identify those people by name. You're not telling them, obviously, but you've got your list. Now that gives you like a, an infrastructure to now have a heads up display as you go through your week on who you're interacting with and how you, how you're going to make decisions. That's really interesting. I didn't think about that, but the salespeople have to deal with that a lot, a lot don't they? Be like entertaining other groups and um, be forced in those social situations. Kevin, Laurel, any thoughts on, on the. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I always just think, you know, asking their values align with their values. Do their goals align with your goals? And if it doesn't, what does that look like? And is it something that you could be, you know, looking at yourself? Is it something you can be a positive role model? And, and instead of going to McDonald's with a group of friends saying, you know, I would rather go get the salad or let's maybe have a walking date instead of a lunch date at McDonald's or something. So just making sure that and really looking at the relationships to see if they align with their own. Do their values align? Do their goals align? And then choosing from there. Yeah, and I'll, yeah. I'll add, you know, in terms of actually our, our behaviors and our, well, health-related behaviors, just behavior in general, um, you don't often think about it in, the, in those, we're not, we're not very good at, at recognizing those those day-to-day -day changes in those behaviors and some of the cause and effects sometimes. But we have, especially around some of these health behaviors, uh, things like wearable devices and, and food logging and things like that, that we can use as an aid here as, as you know, you pose this as the uh, uh, webinar topic. I was thinking about about this too, Ravi. That there's really room to to be using this technology uh, to help us identify some of these behavior changes. And in fact, I was playing around with it myself. I, I use an app called Athletic. We've talked about it before on on the, the yeah. webinar. Actually, no. Again, disclosure: I have no association with them or anything like that. But um, you know, in Athletic, I have the ability to to tag whatever I want. So I could conceivably tag, if I'm trying to figure out what, what my friends are doing to my behavior and doing to my health, I go hang out with Joe. I could tag Joe on that day and then I can look and see, okay, was the last five times I hung out with Joe, my sleep was poor, uh, you know, or, or my diet was bad, or I didn't exercise the next day and, and look at some of those, those metrics. So I think that's an interesting way to, to approach it too, to think about, Yes, how you feel, of course, and those things, but also looking at specific behavior and behavioral results like hours of sleep or recovery or exercise minutes, things like that. So these technologies can help us systematize the, the ability to find these correlations much easier. Yeah. So we can, we can get some, some data by them. And that's really interesting. So I guess the question is... We're, if we're looking for these, you know, if we're, if we're looking for people who are kind of very aligned with our values, very aligned with what our goals want to be, uh, are when we do highlight these people who are detracting us, and I, I can think of so many movies where this is like the plot line, but the one that comes to mind, and if you've ever seen it, it's like heartbreaking to watch. Uh, it's called Rounders. It's got uh, Matt Damon, and I forgot the other guy in it, but it's like, you know, they're both gamblers. And one's just trying to try to a poker player, just trying to make money and kind of get through law school. And the other is, for, you know, the movie starts with him picking his friend out of jail, up from jail. And he's like, hey, let's go play the big games. And you could just see the decisions in Matt Damon's head. It's just like, I should go home to my girlfriend, go back to law school tomorrow, just go play some poker, make a couple bucks. Or, oh, do we need to go? You know, and it's just his friend is just taking him off down the wrong road the entire movie. I'm just like, no, why are you doing this? Um, and it's it's like, how? what do you do to Matt Damon? Like, we've all seen that with members and clients, right? What do you do? What, what do you tell that person to say? Like, what are phrases people can use? How do you even start those difficult conversations? Can you guys give us some examples to, uh, to, to exactly what to say? Because... I feel like there's no way to say this stuff without coming off a little bit mean or a little selfish or whatever. But like we said, we gave ourselves permission earlier in the conversation to be strategic. So can we talk about like the actual practicality of cutting off ties or modifying those connections? 
Well, I think a lot of it is about uh, setting boundaries with people. I think you have yeah. to be very, I think you have to be very clear with your boundaries and communicate the boundaries that you're going to have with people. So if you are, you know, wanting to stop a habit of like gambling or whatever like that, you're going to set a boundary with your friends and say, uh, no, I have a rule. I don't go out after 10 o'clock during the, the week, the work week, or, you know, if it's about drinking or, you know, not want to feel so bad the next day. And you just say, um, no, I don't, I don't have late nights uh, midweek or during the week, you know, just setting these boundaries and just staying firm with them. Um, because sometimes we can become very porous with our boundaries too. Sometimes someone say, oh, come on, it's just this one night, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not going to do you any harm. And then if you cave and you give in, then that's you're not setting up your own boundary. You're not even sticking to your own boundary for yourself. So why should you expect other people to respect your boundaries if they see that you're going to be lenient and, and bend on your own rules you know, around yourself? So I think when you can set boundaries and be very clear and communicate them with others and stick with them, then people will respect that. And if they don't, then they're not your friend. And, you know, you have to say, you know, you have to call it out and just say, you know, every time I say not to call me after 10 o'clock at night or not to, you know, make me feel so guilty about not showing up today, this makes me feel, you know, disappointed in this relationship. You know, you know, what is your, what way are you thinking behind this when you're saying these things to me you know and, and just call it out and and have this you know conversation that might need to be addressed and and you may be looking at it in a different way to your friend they might be saying i didn't look at it this way or now that you have expressed this to me i can see your point on this you know and it might be okay it might be an amical you know change and if it's not then you know where you stand with that friend you know, when they're not somebody that you can rely on that will stick to your boundaries with you. One of the best ways I've found to handle future behavior is uh, deal with it in advance. So you make contingency plans. Let's say you're at a restaurant with Tony and you're having a really healthy meal. And at the end, Tony says, let's get that pie. Well, you can be so shocked that you don't know how to handle the pie mm -hmm. thing. But if you figure it out in a uh, if Tony says, let's get that pie, which he likes to do, what am I going to say? Uh, Tony, that doesn't work for me today, or I, I've reached my limit, or you go ahead if you want, but so you game out these things, and now you maybe visualize them in your head as you're driving to the restaurant. Then when Tony does say, let's have that pie, you've got some ready phrases ready to go, and it's not the first time you've ever said it to Tony. So it kind of flows a lot better. Yeah, I, I love that, Bill. Uh, I really do believe in about rehearsing things and practicing things in your head. If you feel that there's going to be a difficult situation coming up or something that's going to be tempting, definitely rehearsing it in your mind, how you want it to, what, what the outcome you want, what the results you'd like at the end of the night. And, and think of it ahead of time to say, well, if they, if they want to go on and, and go to another bar after the restaurant, you know, what am I prepared to say? What am I going to say to, um, to express how I feel, you know, and be clear right up front or even before you go, you know, to the restaurant, yeah. you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have an early night after dinner, so I won't be going anywhere after the restaurant tonight. Yeah. And, um, but I'm so looking forward to hanging out with you guys today, tonight at the, at the meal. And be very upfront, I think being very assertive like that, I think you are it, look, you're in control and, well, you are in control. You feel <laughs> more in control, you feel more assertive and you don't get ra railroaded or, hijacked um later on in the evening and uh, where you feel like oh now i look like i'm making an excuse maybe i shouldn't say anything and you <laughs> feel awkward and then you bow out and not say anything at all and then you're doing something that you don't want to do you're eating something you don't want to eat you're drinking too much whatever the habit is and um, so yeah i think rehearsing and you know practicing it in your mind visualizing how it looks like the way it's going to go in the evening Evening and what kind of answers you're going to come up with. How do you go to the next step, that next level of actually uh, cutting someone off, right? It's like, okay, you're my friend. There's, there's some behaviors that we diverge on. I don't want to be a part of that. And if you want to go be part of that, go be part of it. But there are other times where you just say, you know, this is just not working out. And this person is kind of sucking up the energy and kind of the motivation for me to do good things and holding me back. 
how do you do the actual cutoff? And I think what you, one thing you mentioned, Rachel, was very interesting is you were talking about other friends calling people out. I think a lot of our significant others are really good at this, right? I mean, I've had, you know, my wife will be like, you know, this person you're hanging out with is not really your friend and you think they are. And they'll call that. And I'll be like, what are you talking about? Like, we have lots of fun. Like, yeah, but sucking up your time, you leave, you leave with a weird negativity and a bad attitude about things. It's like, you're not you. You know, and that's going to run, and they're really worried because they can see that happening. It's like probably people we should pay attention to, right? Who are who could tell us and be honest. But but have you guys ever had to coach people to just cut off friendships that aren't really friendships, and how'd that go? Yes, I mean I've been in that situation myself where I've had to cut off friendships, um, because they were toxic. You know, they were just not working for me, and I uh, it is hard. You know, I can I, I have to say, you know, it does. It's it's quite difficult to keep it calm, and but it, the the way to do it is to stay calm. Is to go in there with the rehearsal, with what you want to say, and you know have the idea of like, well, if they say this, what is my answer to that? You know, have it like look at it from their point of view before you go into it, and say, what is the backlash? What are they going to be angry with me about? What are they going to bring up? And you know try to keep yourself have that self-regulation of staying calm in a moment because getting aggressive or getting angry getting explosive it's just going to put the other person on a defensive mechanism they're going to be ready to attack you it's just going to escalate it's going to get ugly and you know when you are expressing that this isn't working for you and they they will get angry they will get upset because Nobody likes rejection. Everybody's terrified of rejection and it's painful. So you know it's going to be painful for that person. But have some compassion for that. You know, don't, don't get angry. Understand where they're coming from. Understand that this is hurtful. And you don't want to hurt them per se. You just want to cut the ties. But say, I understand that this is, you know, this is not something that you're expecting me to say. Um, I, I'm not here to hurt your feelings. This is just how I feel and I'm ready to move on. And I really wish you the best of luck uh, in your future. And I mean no harm by being honest with you. I think you deserve my honesty in this situation. And if they do just keep escalating, you have to just try to have that self-regulation of being calm and be a good listener. Let them, let them say what they want to say. And they'll feel heard by you. They'll feel that you're understanding their side of it just by listening, just having those pauses, not jumping in, not jumping in to attack them and dispute what they're saying. You know, um, this is something that you're not willing to pursue with them. So you're not going to have to really try to defend yourself to a great extent because you know you're not going to, you're just ending it. So allow them to, express their anger, allow them to express their feelings, be a listener and, you know, say, you know, I hear what you're saying. You know, I can understand. I can hear you're angry with me. That makes sense. You know, um, and I, I'm not here to hurt you and just stay very calm. But, you know, being a good listener in those situations is really crucial because you're coming out on top. You are staying in control of your emotions and by you being calm and being um, supportive in a, in a sense, uh, you're bringing that level of escalation back down and they start to calm down and start to see that you're not there to attack them. You're not there to have a fight. You're there to be honest and clear with your decision. And I think that's really crucial in communicating. Yeah, yeah I love the honesty means- part that you said, you know, is just being really honest, honest with yourself and honest with them and providing, you know, a positive or an alternative, a positive alternative to to further the friendship and offering them a way to maybe align with you so that they can um, be a part of the positive change or the positive journey or the reducing the negativity, allowing them to have that option as well. But the brutal honesty with yourself and then with them is just really respectful to everybody involved. Um, And I'm so sorry, I have to pop off a few minutes earlier. I have a prior engagement. It's been wonderful seeing you Thanks. all. I can't wait for another one when Thanks, you get Laurel. more of these. <laughs> it's really Laurel. positive and engaging. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Laurel. And just just to piggyback off of, of that honesty thing, yeah, I think that it's yeah. extremely important at all levels of this because, you know, conceivably it, it's possible that 
you know, having this conversation with somebody, you could be, they could be feeling similarly. Like you could be yes. almost dragging them down in some ways because you guys have, especially with old friends, I feel like you have years of this established rapport and habits and routines and things that you do together. Maybe they're saying to themselves, man, I really wish we weren't going to the bar like this, or I really wish we weren't uh, eating in this way, whatever it is. But neither of you were honest with each other to bring it up. So you could just be proliferating that and keeping that wheel turning for years and years and years before someone actually says something. So you could find, if honesty is your policy, that, oh, actually, we are in alignment still. We both have been kind of uh, uh, bringing each other down. Yeah, you could actually yeah, find a solution. Really yeah, you could actually find a solution to this. You know, you might say, well, how can we, you know, find a compromise going forward? You know, I'm not a heavy drinker and, you know, I know you like to go out and party or whatever it is. But you might say, you know, where else could we socialize together that it's not, you know, the heavy drinking, you know, because right. I do enjoy parts of our relationship, our friendship. But uh, this other part is really getting me down and I just, you know... Exactly. It's not healthy for me, and I need to set that boundary. And I need to be clear that I'm not doing this that anymore. Makes, I that think so. Sense. I think if you're, especially if you're relating it to well, your health, possibly if that's the issue, and and the behavior, the specific behavior that you're targeting, it's going to be a lot easier to digest on the other side. And you know, if they are truly your friend, like what friend is going to say, "No, I ref I refuse to 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 help you not do this heavy drinking," or "I refuse <laughs> to help you." uh eat better or, or move more like if they are saying that then you they just reaffirmed or they just confirmed what you're uh you know why you're having this conversation in the first place so i think yeah and that, you will find good. friends yeah you will find friends that won't um you know that do want to party and they'll just say oh you're being sure. dull and boring and you know and you go okay we're just at different levels in our in our stages of life right now so Good luck with you and enjoy partying, you know, and just that's Absolutely. the end of it. Yeah. If well, interesting thing. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, Bill. Just as a piggyback, if you look at the uh, world of, let's say, Al Anon, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, all the support group system, uh, basically they're not told to do this, but, but they're essentially trading old friendships with a brand new set of friends. Because if the old friends don't move forward with you, and they're still stuck in dysfunctional behaviors, they're not going to help you. I remember one time when I was a therapist, I had somebody come into my office for therapy. They were an alcoholic, worked with them for a few weeks, comes in and she's really happy. I got a brand new job. In the meantime, she had quit drinking, but I got a brand new job. Well, where are you working? At a bar. That doesn't work. Okay. So you, you got to leave some things behind. You got to have new things and you can test the waters with people just like kevin said maybe the person maybe you just did that person a favor like gee mm -hmm. i'm glad you said that that was on my mind you, you i appreciate your guts for speaking up and saying something well you're helping me too and now you can take that person with you but mm -hmm. it's it's just kind of a fact of life that some people will not come with you on your journey and you can't feel bad about that yourself maybe temporarily but you can't let that pull you down that makes sense. And I know we yeah, have I a couple of other worry too much. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. Go on. No, no, please. No, please. Right yeah, so no, we, we worry a lot about what other people think of us and what other people want, but we really do have to prioritize what our needs and wants are. And we are not, a lot of us are not taught to be that way growing up. You know, a lot of us are people pleasers and we're wanting that community and that connection with other people. And sometimes we are caving and giving into things that are not healthy for us just to fit in and we, we need to stop that you know so we don't get into those bad habits ourselves yeah and it takes a lot of practice i think too because i think a lot of us like you said just don't grow up that way yeah and, and some people do some people kind of have that my way the highway thing from the very beginning i just i'm not like that so i'm always jealous of most people how they do that now, i know we have yeah. some limited time but what i want to do is we had some topics around a kind of family and things like that. I think I'll leave family out of this for now, but one thing maybe we can touch on is this idea of, and I'll try to put them into one one category here, but the idea of the professional circle. And the reason I brought this up is because you know, this idea of performance and bringing each other together in teams, 
really comes into these the other circles where we spend a lot of our time. Like most of our waking hours are at work around other teams and people and people that we we are almost in we're, we almost are captive in some sense, right? We can choose our friends we want to hang out with in our own time, but you may not necessarily be able to choose everyone in the office around you. And so, like, how do you handle these situations with people when you are, you know, when, when, it's, when it's shown, you know, in the literature, there's good data on, um, you know, feeling motivated and feeling connected to others and increased health is related to, you know, camaraderie with colleagues and more connections to the company and feeling inspired about your mission there, you feeling valued and that the company has values and that you also have transparency to what's going on and you have some autonomy. And so you can see when those things are taken away or limited, and leads to burnout, which is one of the most obvious, uh, obvious uh, examples of that is in the healthcare field, right? Where nurses and doctors are burning out and they have like a, a huge loss of autonomy and transparency and caregivers in general, and they don't feel connected and they don't feel valued. Um, and and it's, it's really, really affecting them into very serious ways. And like, how do we optimize those professional circles where we are, maybe our choices are a little, a little um, uh, limited. And if we could dovetail that into this kind of question about, you know, I think this is the the thing that kind of bridges friends we want to have is mentors. How do we find mentors, bosses, um, or leaders that we kind of want to be friends with them? We want to enter that circle because we know it'll be good for us. And I feel like there's a there's an overlap there between our personal lives and our professional lives because a lot of us are always trying to find mentors. And we never really talk about it. So can we talk about that that professional environment and how do we optimize there? for where we don't have control over everyone we're hiring who may be working with us. We're just going to throw onto a team. Yeah, I think so if you are looking for mentors, I think it's important to, you know, seek them out in the workplace, you know, to, you know, if you're looking to uh, get promoted or you're looking to elevate your um, skill sets, it's looking and seeking out those people uh, deliberately in the workplace place and see if there's somebody willing to be a mentor to you and ask you know and ask them their background and and what knowledge they have and would they be willing to be a mentor to you because you admire their work and you uh, see them at meetings and you, you see them very professional and um you have great admiration for them and and uh you can see they're very knowledgeable and, and have a lot of wisdom to share so uh yeah you could save yourself a lot of time um, if you have a mentor by your side, uh, supporting you and guiding you, because they have years of experience ahead of you, and they could cut that time for you in sh so short um, by sharing what they have to help you along the way. Thanks, Rachel. So, yeah. Yeah. Bill, I know you were going to say something there. Right. So, um, in an ideal world, someone would join a organization or corporation with a very healthy culture if you join a organization and the culture isn't very healthy that's very difficult to navigate in very difficult to change because the people in the positions of power maybe are the dysfunctional ones and even if they're not how come they're not changing the culture if they have the power so they're kind of semi-dysfunctional uh, by default and uh, there was a book i won't say the full title because it's not a very nice name but it was a Stanford management professor Robert Sutton, he wrote the book, The No Jerk Rule, uh, Building a Civilized Workplace and Surviving One That Isn't. And um, a lot of corporations will just say, or managers will say, I don't hire jerks. Uh, I don't care how high flying they are, how much they can help us. They'll help us this much, but they're going to hurt us this much as well. So I hire healthy people who are high flyers. So that's the kind of environment hopefully someone goes into. Um, I think the reality is once you're in an organization, you, you tend to like water seeks its own level. You, you tend to find people you connect with, other people you stay away from. And hopefully if you have some degree of influence in the organization, now you start to make some headway. You make suggestions, you're a role model, you talk to people in power, you try to change the culture to as much as you can to your limited ability. Uh, but, the, you know, the culture is bigger than one individual person. And that, that's the difficult part. Um, years ago, uh, corporations had regular uh, mentors built into the fabric. Uh, uh, high executives would uh, mentor the lower ones just regularly. That's gone away, and that's why we have external coaches that are doing that now. So it's kind of rare. The other thing that's going on is near-peer coaching. In fact, I just read an article about uh, near-peer coaching and test anxiety coaching for physicians, and that study talked about how near-peer coaching made a huge difference in the ability for the physicians to cope 
and manage the anxiety. So there's near peer coaching. You get mentor mentoring, like let's say amateur where there's no money involved. Then you get professional coaching where it's kind of a mentor relationship, but money's you know changing hands. Uh, very important. I think people on the way up can be very. Um, what's ahead of them can be very mysterious. A lot of unknowns. I haven't gone there yet. What do I do? I've got anxiety. And a mentor can be amazing in helping that person cut through the mystery and stay grounded and, you know, create a little career pathway. Hey, Bill, I'm, I'm not familiar out? with that, uh, that, that term. I've never heard that before. Is it just what it sounds like that near peer uh, code? Is that just what, mm. what it sounds like with uh, someone who's close to you at your level and, or whatever it may be? Exactly. And I'm trying to think of another company that has this, um, I'll look it up when we're done and get it to you. But some companies are training non-professional, non-counselor, peer counselors to manage uh, mental wellness. Uh, Interesting. They go through a nice training program. They get a little badge or something. They wear around the, the you know facility and people know who they are. That would be like near peer type coaching for mental wellness. Now, they're not doing the work of a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist. They're listening. Right. You know, Rachel talked about the deep listening, being present, engaged with the person. Then if there needs to be a referral, they know how to refer out. So they're kind of like a, a, a psychological midwife, if you will, you know, yeah. kind of in that arena. So that, I mean, that's a real trend I've been reading about lately that I think is uh, pretty powerful. And people like that. They, they like to be that person to help other people. That, to me, is a sign of a really healthy culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, emotional intelligence is very is key when it comes to um, feeling that psychological safety and work and everything to be able to share your um, your you know your opinion on things without feeling you know you're going to lose your job or you're going to get demoted or you're going to be you know in trouble in some way. So yeah, it's very it's very important for mentors and things to be able to help you with you know kind of navigating yourself around certain circles as well in, in that culture and, and understand what the culture is really like in that company. And mentors can really give you a, a leg up on that when from the beginning, which is great. Yeah, it's the centers of influence concept is really interesting too, Bill, but I, that you were mentioning before uh, in accordance with the, all what Kevin and Rachel, you guys are saying as well with the, with this idea of culture being emergent. But what I've also noticed is it doesn't take much to set off a trend or, or start a ritual that people notice. And what I mean, an example is, um, you know, we would have in a, in a previous company I'd um, worked with, um, you know, I would go, I would go, one, one individual actually used to go to the gym at noon every day, which is part of his ritual. And I started going after that too. I was like, oh, this is kind of okay. You know, it's like one person had to do it. And the fear was, well, this is detracting from the workday. And that's just an unfounded fear. And no one was, no one was saying anything about it. I was like, it was encouraged. And everyone was okay with it. It's just that someone had to take that first step. You know, the first, the, the penguin at the end of the line that had to be pushed into the water and it wasn't eaten by the seal. And um, it was, you know, then all right. So I feel like when it comes to workplace health and mental health, definitely there's those things that we were talking about, the, the near peer coaching and those counselors, but also even the physical aspects of choosing where you work. I think it has to be a factor now. Like, do they have access mm -hmm. to things where you can get away and uh, exercise or things like that or they have an environment which is has some aspect of the outdoors i tweeted this thing the other day about the data behind um the positivity that comes from even just looking at pictures of nature versus even uh, versus it is better than just sitting right mm -hmm. um and obviously being able to do five minute walks outside is it's much better still you know the ferrari factory you know in modena italy they have trees inside the factory uh, near the assembly line, and they have like you know skylights are coming in because like, no, we have to make this. Now that could just be crazy Italians doing crazy Italian things, <laughs> but I think it's a great a great trend, right? I mean, it's it's it's, it's a step in the right direction to have that kind of nature inside. So I feel like people could could be very choosy about these social circles or these professional circles uh, it, where they work in, in a lot of ways, in the salary, the mission they're working on stuff, but possibly need to put this into the calculus as well when they're when they're looking for opportunities and jobs and sorting them out to ones that fit their health lifestyle. And if those companies can't encourage it, incentivize it, create opportunities and spaces for that to happen, it's like it would be I would put it lower on my list of all things being equal. And if I was searching between two different organizations. 
consultants who work in change management know that when there's a transition underway in an organization, that that's one of the most easy times to make changes because everything's changing. So I'll change too. But look, they're changing. They're changing. I'll change. And the other one is what Robbie said, the influencer. Why do we have social influence people in social media? Because people look to them. So you have someone in a corporation or a group or a team or a club or whatever. And that's a leverage point. That person, that's the role model they look to. The example you gave is incredible. Oh, it's okay now. So that person gives the, uh, you know, the okay, not verbally, now everybody follows. Yeah, I think it's important that the leaders in the company are definitely the influencers. It's, it's, it's you know, showing the way they want the company to run. You know, if they're going to show that they can give you autonomy and trust and allow you to share your opinions in meetings without getting, you know, bombarded or get into trouble or in any way, and they leave it open for discussion or suggestions. I'd love to hear feedback from you guys, you know, have it an open discussion, allow that trust and safety around uh, the workplace. Uh, then people are more open and more flexible to communicating, you know, more honestly when they feel safe in their company. And I think the leaders, really start that uh, trend. They start that, you know, instilling that into the company uh, all the way down different levels. That makes sense. And if I can, I think I use that to transition a little bit here, I know we're running out of time, um, into this idea of role, that you mentioned role modeling and um, uh, this of showing up for other people. That was the last topic I had. Because we've been talking about how to, to choose friends who are kind of aligned with us. But how do we bring others up? How do we become those friends that people want to become, you know, our, they want to become part of our circle? How do we show up for other people and be healthy? You know, and obviously role modeling is a big part of that. So we engage in these behaviors. You know, do we start, do, is that clustering start working? Do we start attracting people in our circle who are also in those, wanting to do those behaviors? We start attracting healthy people and we start running or we start eating right? Are, are we influencing others? Is that important for our well being? Yeah, I think we just need to be um, just that light for everyone. Like I think when we are making healthy choices and changes and um, talking about it, being energized, being excited about it, and um, you're definitely leveling up um, everyone around you because people get inspired. People get, they, they feed off your energy and it's like a magnet. You know, you start to bring those kind of people towards you because they're like, oh my gosh, you know, that sounds like fun that, you know, you make exercising sound great. You know, when do you, what time of day works for you? And they might say mornings. Well, I've never tried mornings. Maybe I'll, maybe if it's okay with you, I'll try one morning with you and see if it'll help me. You know, you're going great, you know, the more the merrier. And I think it's, it's really just changing your energy to be outward, you know, to show that, you know, I want to, um, and still being around people that are healthy, just like me. I want to be around that kind of environment. And, um, and just being very, you know, thoughtful about it, being very um, deliberate in your energy of what you want to portray out to the world is important. I think sometimes we just kind of, we don't want to just be fumbling around in life and just randomly saying things. You know, if you notice that you're kind of going into these negative words phrases saying oh i'm eating a salad again today you're not going to get people to go in the same direction with you they're going to go yeah that sounds sucky i'm not doing that either horrible. <laughs> that's horrible that but if you horrible. if you yeah. notice that you're going to do something like that just say but you know what i went to the gym this morning and it was hard work so i'm eating this salad because i deserve to keep this good body and they go yeah good for you i like the sound of that that sounds great i then you're kind of inspiring people to kind of be on that path with you to say, you know what, now you're making me feel bad sitting here at my burger, you know, or whatever. And you're not, you know, judging them or anything like that, but you're, you're helping them along the way to maybe change their habits too and be around like-minded people. So I, I should know the name. I should know the name of this because our daughter drives a Mercedes. But what's the name of that little, um, uh, thing they have uh, which is a warning system of an uh, overtaking car in your blind spot you, you know what i'm talking yeah, about the blind spot the blind spot monitoring system a little orange light that comes the mirror. out yeah there yeah. you go so very helpful little thing so 
we all have a blind spot in life, everybody. Even though people don't think they have one, they probably have a bigger one. So I think another part of being a role model and a leader is helping people see their blind spots compassionately and in a friendly way and in a kind way. For example, my good friend Steve, I've known him 25 years, retired anesthesiologist, see him three or four times a year. Every time you see, you're looking good, Bill. Or if I'm not looking good, he'll say something about why I'm not looking good. Or you put on a few pounds or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I get a little diagnosis right away with Steve, but it's all done very friendly, com compassionately. Mm -hmm. That's an example where he feels comfortable enough to be honest with me to give the feedback. And uh, I think that's a really key thing about leaders is giving that feedback compassionately and honestly in this health realm where people have a sudden insight. No one else is telling me that, but Kevin, Kevin is my buddy. No one, Kevin, no, no one else. So again, that intimacy, the closeness, the honesty, that's really key. And we come back to the original thing we talked about, all these acquaintances, they're not going to tell us that, okay, at all. Now, there's other influences they have on us, but they're not going to be that person like my friend Steve. Mm. So most people around That's us, a great point. example of, of his wife, same thing, you know, the more honest we can be with people around us, they appreciate that. One thing I learned in all my years of, uh, you know, psychotherapy training is you can tell anybody anything if you say it with kindness. And if, exactly. they, know you care, yeah. if they know you care, they will listen and they won't be mm -hmm. offended. And I think that's a really key thing when it comes to behavior change. Yeah, I th that's exactly what was going on in my mind when you were saying the whole time. It's all about uh, communicating kindness. You know, it's all about being kind and considerate of other people's feelings because you have no idea what other people are going through. And um, you can elevate other people and just the awareness that you're in an environment with other people and you know, you want to share that kindness and express yourself in a, in a compassionate way with other people too. It's just seeing them from where they are and dropping any judgment of people. And I think, um, you know, that goes far when you're, you know, developing trust with new people and that feeling of safety that they can open up and, and be themselves. That's really helpful. Uh we have, we're at an hour and 10 minutes, or about to be an hour and 10 minutes. So we've covered a lot of topics. These are huge topics, and we can come talking about these forever. And, and I'm, I'm happy to um, provide any additional references to for us. To, I know I've talked about a couple of papers and things, and I'll put them in the, in the YouTube description. That's where you can find this webinar. You'll find it on YouTube, and we'll post it on Twitter and things like that, too. And we'll cut it up and, and, dice, and slice and dice it into, into smaller pieces that are more digestible but just want to thank you all so much for contributing and taking the time out of your lives um to to talk about these things because um this is a difficult thing for people to examine because like you all said at the very beginning we just accept friends as just is a is a just a consequence of on, uh, of um of just hap uh, of, of happenstance instead of an intention intentional choices like we probably should and uh, be planning for as well so is there anything else, any closing comments you'd like to, to see or uh, to say, or uh, now's the time. Otherwise, um, you know, I'll just say thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just hop in with one, one quick thing. I think just, uh, uh, Hey, to, to end on some action that for the, for those listening live or on YouTube, you know, I think a tremendous, amazing way to spend 15 minutes based on what we just said would be to get pen and paper, and actually write down those qualities that you want in your friends, you know, that, that you're looking for, what's important to you. Actually take the time, write, write it down. Instead of speaking in generalities, be specific about what you are looking for and what's important to you. And then to get to what you were saying a little bit at the end there, uh, Ravi, the hard, maybe even harder part, flip it around on yourself and say, do I, am I this person for, for my friends? I think uh, literally that, that practice will take you 15 minutes and I can't imagine a more valuable the 15 minutes of your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Well, totally agree. Yeah, and, and just getting great, very yeah. clear on your boundaries as well is just what boundaries, you know, mm -hmm. what are you willing to, what are your likes and dislikes when it comes to friendships? You know, what are you willing to take and tolerate or what are your, you know, you know you're not going to take and tolerate from people? So it's it's getting very clear on those and communicating those boundaries. I don't think we do that enough. We don't, we're always afraid to rock the boat and, and express ourselves, but it, 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 we're not rejecting them. We're just being honest and clear with our directions. 
So see, this is this, I, this incredible insight. And, and I, I have to put a plug in for us here because it's just so well deserved um, after insight like this. And thanks, Kevin, for that very nice piece of homework too, which is super practical. Um, if you, you know, everyone watching, if you want advice like this and you want to take through, been, if you like the idea of being taken through a structured program where you get this kind of, this kind of, um, uh, I would, I don't want to say therapy, but insight, yeah, insight, into yourself. insight, yeah, that, that's right. Just you know, find us at uh, you know www.daytona.health and book a discovery call, and we'll see if we're a good fit to help you. But you know, our team loves doing this stuff. We live and breathe this, and we really can. You know, care about people's well-being, and that means treating all those things as we can, as much as we can, in that circle that we we started this conversation with, right? So it's not just what pills and what doses are you taking today. It's the behaviors, it's the social, it's the environment, it's the economic stability. Um, so thank you guys all very much for being here, and um, I'll send a link and update um, our intro communication and our social media with uh, where people would find um, this webinar. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That's great. Thank Take you. Care. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs>